This is a report about the science of sea level rise, which is similar in the same vein to one that we did earlier that was on water quality, because I'm a believer that in understanding environmental matters, a knowledge of basic relevant science is fundamental. And of course, climate science is vast and there's a great range of scientific disciplines involved. This report is focused on one of the certain effects of climate change, one indeed that is already happening, a rising sea. And this photo has been taken uh, just north of the Harbour Bridge in Auckland, looking back towards Takapuna. In January 2011, there was a king tide and a storm surge, and there was also a higher sea. Coastal flooding like this will become more frequent in many places. In chapter two of the report, we do a kind of a historical traverse. Um, and we go back to 18th century scientists who of course called themselves natural philosophers and they wandered around Europe doing their OE, which they called grand tours of course. Uh, and they observed the landscape in places like Switzerland and were struck by a number of oddities. And this photograph is a rock of a kind they called an erratic a really big rock, miles away from any other rock of the same kind. And from that, they deduced that Europe must once have been covered with ice because there was no way that water could have carried a rock of that size. And when the ice melted, the rock just dropped down into place. And so that really was a beginning of a realization among Western scientists that in the past, the Earth's climate had been very different. And gradually, over two and a half centuries, the understanding grew of how the climate had in fact changed many times through a sequence of ice ages interspersed by warm periods called interglacials. We are now in an interglacial and have been for the last 12,000 years, an interglacial that is called the Holocene. Now in that chapter we go through some of the early scientists who made key, key breakthroughs. One of my staff calls this the rogues gallery. Um, I'm particularly fond of the one on the left who was called James Kroll. He was a janitor at a library at Edinburgh University and for years he made his brother do his work while he sat in the library and read books voraciously and then ended up making a major change to climate science as a result. The one second from the right is Arrhenius who in the late 19th century predicted that the world would warm because of all the coal being burned since the Industrial Revolution. Arrhenius thought a warming world would be a good thing because he came from Sweden. Um, but we are well past those times, scientifically speaking, and now we uh, rely on science that comes from sediment cores that are drilled deep into the ocean floor, on ice cores that are drilled in Greenland and Antarctica, and those tell the story of the Earth's climate. But in the last two decades, we've also had an enormous amount of information from satellites giving us information like this, these photographs are often published, the decline in the sea ice that is floating in the Arctic Ocean. Hugely important in understanding climate change are the accelerators and the brakes, which are called feedbacks. Positive feedbacks, the accelerators, speed up warming. Negative feedbacks, the brakes slow it down. And this photo shows you one of the accelerators you can see how over time uh, the white reflective ice is being replaced by dark ocean and the, that dark ocean absorbs more of the sun's heat so it becomes a positive feedback. And unfortunately, the positive feedbacks are far outweighing the negative feedbacks so far. But we've been in this warm, stable period, the Holocene, for the last 12,000 years, but now things are heating up. And some scientists have used the word Anthropocene to denote that we are actually moving out of the Holocene into what is a different era. And there are three things going on that are of particular significance. One of them is carbon dioxide is rising due to the burning of huge quantities of coal and oil and gas since the Industrial Revolution. Following from that, the temperature, the global mean temperature of the Earth is rising. And as one of the consequences, the sea is responding and also rising, and I'm now going, we'll focus mostly on that in this talk. So first, carbon dioxide. This is a, a graph, quite famous, known as the Keeling curve. Keeling was a very sort of pernickety, precise scientist who began measuring the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere on the top of a volcano in Hawaii, measuring it with great accuracy in the 1960s. 
and he found a little sawtooth pattern over each year, which happens with a season sometimes described to as the earth breathing, but you can see how it's gone up and up. Um, and in New Zealand, we've also made a contribution to these measurements of carbon dioxide around the world. I don't know if Dave Lowe, David Lowe is here today. There he is, <laughs> and there he is at Bearing Head. <laughs> so Bearing Head, a perfect place to measure carbon dioxide. Nice and uh, windy. Um, but moving, we can go back beyond the Keeling curve, back in time, using ice core data, because the ice cores contain little bubbles of air from the past, and you can measure the carbon dioxide in those bubbles. And you can see from about 1830 onwards how carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has risen. Um, and this is what has happened to global mean surface temperature, the average temperature across the world in the land and the top of the ocean, over the same time. It jumps around quite a bit with short-term things happening like El Nino cycles and volcanic eruptions. But last Friday, NOAA, the science agency in the US that deals with the ocean and the atmosphere, reported, and I quote, it is becoming pretty clear that 2014 will end up as the warmest year on record. This is a graph of what sea, the sea level has been doing, and it's not jumping around, it just keeps on going. And since 1900, the sea, the mean sea level around the world has risen by 20 centimetres. Why is it rising? Three different processes are going on. One of them is expanding water. The second one is retreating glaciers. And the third one is shrinking ice sheets. So moving first to expanding water, when water gets hotter, it expands, and so you get a greater volume of seawater, and therefore a higher sea. This rather impressive fellow is launching what's called an Argo float, which measures the temperature of seawater. They can do that at different depths, well, again with great accuracy now. Second thing is retreating glaciers. This is the Franz Josef, which we're familiar with, of course. Like most around the world, it is retreating, putting more water into the sea. And you can see the shaded bit is where it was in 1865, and the ice is where it is now. The third one, ice sheets, shrinking ice sheets, is the one that um, where the most uncertainty lies and the hardest to predict. This is a photo of meltwater on one of the giant glaciers that comes down to the sea from the Greenland ice sheet. So ice sheets are thick ice on land, and there are three of them, one covering Greenland and the two covering Antarctica, one in the east and one in the west. And again, as I said, the, where the big uncertainties lie is in what will happen to these three ice sheets. They are kilometres thick. And to give you a sense of how much ice is in them, and I'm not saying this is going to happen tomorrow by any means. <laughs> if all the ice in them were to be melted, the sea would rise by 64 metres. It gives you a sense of just how much ice is contained in those ice sheets. It's a map of Antarctica. You can see uh, the dark line of the Trans-Antarctic Mountains separating the two ice sheets, the east from the west. The grey areas around the coast on that map are, are known as ice shelves, and it's important to distinguish between ice sheets and ice shelves. Sheets are huge blankets of ice that sit on the land, on the bedrock, and shelves are thick layers of ice that are attached to the land around the edge, but they float on the sea. Uh, what happens to these ice shelves is critically important in thinking about ice sheet dynamics. The biggest ice shelf is the Ross ice shelf, you can see it there in the south, which is the size of France. It's not small. But staying with France, this is a photo of Notre Dame. Um, the flying buttresses at Notre Dame, they fly up from the ground to the walls holding them up. And this is exactly the way in which the ice shelves keep ice sheets stable in many parts of Antarctica. They are flying buttresses that hold ice sheets on the land. They brace themselves against the edges of bays. So when ice sheets break up, it is very worrying because it affects the stability of the ice sheets. You often hear about the Larsen B ice sheet. It was twice the size of Stewart Island. And this is what happened to it in five weeks in 2002. And on that first photo, you can see uh, within the red line between the mountains and the sea, that's the ice shelf with meltwater forming on the top. But he here it is two weeks later, starting to go, and another week, and two more weeks, and it's gone. There's another big concern in Antarctica. 
uh, the ice shelves are one major concern. The level of the ground, the topography of the ground under the ice sheets is another. Now, this is a, a, a map of the, the, the bedrock of um, Antarctica. Everywhere there's blue, the bedrock is below the sea level. And if warm water, is uh, seawater can get in and trickle down where that rock is sloping backwards down from the sea, it can start melting the ice from below. So not only can you have ice melting from above with meltwater, but you can have uh, ice being melted from below. So you can see uh, th those are the two things that the scientists worry about. But as I said earlier, we've already had 20 centimetres in the last 100 years or so of sea level rise. By 2050, which is not that far away now, the official projections are for another 30 centimetres. And that 30 centimetres is locked in. It's regardless of what we do about greenhouse gas emissions. After 2050, what we do about greenhouse gas emissions now and in the future matters more and more. If we carry on the way we are, we'll be up to a metre average around the world by the end of the century. And these are the IPCC numbers. Rising seas are going to have some dramatic effects on some parts of the world, like Bangladesh, where millions of people live in low-lying river deltas, and Pacific islands like Tuvalu, which islands that New Zealand has special relationships with. But there will most certainly be impacts on our coastal nation. In some places, a small rise will have a big effect. This is the same storm as on the cover of the report, Auckland in 2011. It's not the northern motorway this time, this is the northwestern motorway. Uh, the conditions again, a storm surge and a king tide, a very high tide. Add on a higher sea and the frequency of this kind of flooding rises. Niwa are projecting that in 30 years time, this level of flooding in Auckland will occur about once every 10 years and a few decades later, about once a year. Uh, here's another photo from Auckland, Tamaki Drive earlier this year, again the high tide and the storm. Another problem, coastal erosion, this is a photo of Omaha Beach north of Auckland where the sand dunes are under severe attack from the sea. But Christchurch, this is Christchurch uh, after the earthquakes, Christchurch after the earthquakes has been described as giving us a glimpse into the future because there in parts of Christchurch land has sunk to half a metre which is equivalent, land sinking is equivalent to the sea rising. And you're getting heavy rain causing flooding because the flood water can't drain away. You've lost the fall to the sea. Um, flood insurance has become harder to get and excesses have shot up. Rising seas are going to threaten infrastructure of all kinds in New Zealand. Homes, other buildings, roads, rail, stormwater systems, sewage systems and sea walls. Councils around the country are starting to grapple with this but it's really difficult. It's difficult for everyone, those whose homes uh, might be vulnerable, and it's difficult because there's billions of dollars of infrastructure involved. The Insurance Council has just released a plan for dealing with natural hazards, and at its release, the Chief Executive made special mention of climate change, and he said this, at the moment, we put a huge price on living as close as possible to the sea. We know in 50 years' time that will be a very costly price. To me, that says we're going to see coastal property in some areas become less desirable, and there are implications for banks and all sorts of other organisations here. Next year, I expect to release a follow-up report to this one about the middle of next year. It will show in some detail which areas around the country are the most vulnerable to sea level rise and assess the risk to infrastructure in those areas. Now, thank you very much, and now I shall take questions. <laughs> I'm not sure where he is <laughs> in relation to the beach. Um, I think um, what you've got at Omaha is, is a situation where you have these uh, groins uh, around the sand dunes to protect the buildings that are there. Um, obviously, one of the responses to the rising sea is to build defences against the sea. Um, that's not going to be tenable everywhere and not long term, but I can't comment specifically on Omaha Beach, let alone the Prime Minister's house. We've, had, we've started to have some engagement with banks, actually, interestingly, during this uh, investigation. And 
uh, a number of people in them are becoming concerned and interested in thinking about it. Uh, certainly the insurance company, after this, especially after the experience in Christchurch, are well aware of the problem and uh, are calling along with local government New Zealand for a bigger role for central government here. Um, I think, you know, if you imagine now um, a 30-year mortgage on some coastal property that is vulnerable, um, maybe how long, bef you know, maybe you get to a point where the insurance is not renewable, you can't get insurance on it after a certain point. That's when these events become a certain frequency, the insurance companies say no more. But again, so going back to the banks, for example, um, you know, we could, there could be problems of negative equity, um, so on. No, no, we, we, we have um, described, you know, the basic things that are going on. Uh, we have had it all peer reviewed. Um, we have relied on the IPCC reports, uh, but also on more recent uh, journal articles from Science and Nature, uh, the most uh, respected peer review journals to um, bring some of that information up to date. But there are uh, people in Wellington who know a lot more than we do. The work, the work for next year has, has only just begun, so I can't give you an overall view, but you can look at where councils are becoming concerned. So obviously the Kapiti Coast has been one, uh, close to Wellington. In South Dunedin, um, they're worried. Uh, one of the boreholes um, down into the water table in South Dunedin uh, fluctuates up and down with tides, an indication that it's linked to the sea, and therefore as the sea rises, the water table rises. Um, so there's, they're worried about the water table there. Um, I know um, well, Auckland, obviously, with this frequency of the coastal flooding. Um, we've had interactions with quite a lot of the councils over this. They're starting to really think about it and how to engage with their communities because it's very difficult for them and it's very difficult for um, the people involved. Well, in our second report, we'll be hoping to make some kind of estimate of what's what that impact will be. But as I say, you can always already see in Auckland um, those two motorways, parts of them are in some difficulty already. Well, I can't say what will rule in and out. Um, as you know, sedimentation is actually a huge problem in the Kaipara Harbour. Um, so, yes, I, I, I can't, I'm not ruling anything in, in or out at the moment. Well, it's the extreme weather events that make the rising sea a problem. You know, um, a, a, when you have those storms and when you have um, the high tides and then you get much more frequent coastal flooding. So it's all tied together, really. Mm. But we, we, we are looking specifically at sea level rise, but um, yeah, we're not looking at all the impacts of climate change. <laughs> yep. Quite likely. I would like it to. Um, uh, we can do what we can do. You know, we, we, we believe in doing things thoroughly and we'll see how far we get. Yep. Well, what central government has done so far is provide some guidance. There's some guidance for the Minister of the Environment as to the kinds of levels that um, councils might plan for. The problem is that. Um, again, because of the um, investments involved, uh, both emotional as well as money, um, this is very difficult for councils. And uh, of course, what has gone up on in Kapiti is um, a, a really an illustration of that, where the council actually put uh, coastal flooding risk on the LIM reports of 1,800 homes and uh, was then challenged in court. Uh, the council actually won that in court, but they have decided to drop that for now because of the, um, they wanted to try and take the community more with them, and they're, so they're, they're regrouping. But under law, uh, the Kapiti Council and the current law is obliged to do something about this. So um, I do feel for the councils in this, um, but what central government should do, as I said, local government New Zealand and, and indeed the insurance council have both called publicly for government to issue a, a national policy statement or a national environmental standard um, 
to uh, put some, if you like, some legal heft behind what councils need to do. Uh, that's what's going on at the moment. Certainly, uh, councils are asking for help. I hope I will make recommendations in the next report. Um, but what we're trying to do here is to um, raise this awareness that we need to have a national discussion. We need to be aware of this, that 30 centimetres is coming ready or not. And we need to get ready in terms of you know, which areas we allow co more coastal development to go, to go on in. We need to, um, I mean, I, if I was government, was, um, was I government to do a short time horizons, but I'd be wondering about um, future fiscal risk um, liabilities that could come home to both central government and local government. Um, but we need, to, we need to be thinking about this, I think, as, as New Zealand Inc., because it involves business. Um, we, so we're already seeing the insurance company on the bank starting to take an interest in this. This involves all of us. We need to think about it. But can I just say, as well as that, 30 centimetres coming ready or not, beyond that, when you get into the second half of the century, um, what we do about greenhouse gas emissions starting now makes a big difference. And if we, if we don't want this process to go on and on, um, we need to be act so I'm, we need to act in that area as well. But I think for me, uh, personally, I had not studied the IPCC projections before and I did not realise that 30 centimetres was built in and I did not realise that we'd already had 20 centimetres since 1900. So um, if I didn't know that, in my role. <laughs> I suspect most New Zealanders won't either. Mm. Well, you see, you see it in, uh, in, in a sense, you see it in Christchurch, where um, you get a, you get, to get a disaster and people are uninsured or not insured adequately, and the government has had to step in with a huge amount of money. So in a way, the Christchurch situation is a glimpse for what the future might hold. Um, if councils allow development in areas in the knowledge that um, maybe they shouldn't, uh, there may be also liability falling on them. But you know, this is this is for us. I think for us to have a conversation and think about it. Um, you know, we can't provide all the answers here. It's something we need to think about and embed into our thinking. Absolutely. I think a lot of government departments um, ought to be taking an interest in this, and indeed they are. Uh, my team in doing this investigation have talked with um, an, quite a number of them, and, as well as different councils, and have found a great deal of interest. So I think it's something that um, you know, many of us need to worry about. I think that a country that brands itself as clean and green uh, should be doing more than being a fast follower. And I've said this, um, I've said on many occasions, I believe the emissions trading scheme is the right tool, but it has been eviscerated and is little more than a framework. And I look forward next year to the opportunities when New Zealand makes its next commitment at Paris and also the emissions trading scheme is to be reviewed next year. So there are opportunities there for us to do better.